Good evening. No, we can do better. Let's go. Good evening. Thank you, students who know I have to give you a grade. OK, that's good. Appreciate that. So my name is Ben Dworkin. I am the founding director of the Rowan Institute for Public Policy and Citizenship. On behalf of Rowan University and the Institute, I want to welcome all of you to our evening with the New Jersey Assembly Majority Leader, the Honorable Lou Greenwald. <laughs> I am, I am thrilled that uh, all of you, so many of you, could join us tonight on this wet uh, night. So thank you for braving the roads and being here. I do want to uh, acknowledge and thank our Rowan co-sponsors, including the Bontavoglio Honors Concentration, the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies, the Departments of History, Law and Justice, and the Department of Political Science and Economics, and the Program in American Studies. I also want to recognize the strong financial support of New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance, NJM, who has helped underwrite all of our programming uh, for the year. Now, at this point, I'd like to ask everybody to take out their cell phone, please. And as is our RIPAC tradition, I'm asking you to take a selfie of yourselves right now and post it on your social media and tell everybody how awesome it is to be at Rowan University. So let's do this. You can all look up and smile. Here we go. One, two, three. That's a keeper. OK, that's good. <laughs> and then please turn your phone off so it doesn't ring <laughs> in the middle of our program tonight. <laughs> The vision of the Rowan Institute for Public Policy and Citizenship, or as we call it, RIPAC, is to raise the next generation of citizen leaders at all levels of political engagement. We aim to empower Rowan's 23,000 students, our faculty, our staff, and our fellow citizens to participate in our democracy by elevating their political knowledge and skills. This aspirational agenda is in part of what it really means to be a university of the future. And here to say a few words about what it means to be that kind of university is part of our leadership team. Please join me in welcoming the provost, the chief academic officer of Rowan University, Dr. Tony Lohman. low for me. I speak low anyway. How about that? How about now? Can we hear me all? Okay. Welcome everybody to Rowan University tonight. Welcome to our students. How many students? Where are our students in the crowd tonight? Look at this. What a great turnout. How great is it to be back doing these things on campus again? We're glad to have you back. So I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight for our speaker. Uh, we have a lot of wonderful, distinguished guests, uh, probably too, too numerous to name out here in our audience. But I, I, I thank you for coming out tonight to see Lou Greenwald speak. I want to, I was handed a script, but you know what? You have your biography in there. And I, I really want to just talk to our audience about uh, the great work that Lou Greenwald has done for, for South Jersey. He's been a great advocate. A lot of the things, students, that you're seeing here tonight the things we have on our campus, the offerings we have, uh, are thanks to his leadership and his commitment to, to us in South Jersey. So thank you for everything you've done. Um, I'm thinking back to, to just a couple of things in the last year that have made an impact on our university, but also our region. Um, last year, remember around this time, we were pushing to get everyone vaccinated uh, in one of the lead sites at the state that first got stood up was Rowan Medicine in Stratford. And this was thanks to Mr. Greenwald's effort to get Rowan involved with the vaccination site, putting his trust in us and vaccinating and saving thousands of lives in South Jersey. So without his work, that would have never happened. So thank you. I think it was about a year ago you were there as we opened up, trying to figure out what we're doing, watching thousands of people scared, not knowing what they were getting into, but knowing that what we were doing was saving lives. So, so that was a great endeavor. 
And the other that comes to mind is, is, is our nationally recognized CARES Institute that serves hundreds if not thousands of abused children in our region. And with his efforts at the State Assembly and making sure that that program has the resources to serve children in South Jersey has, has truly been phenomenal. So I wanna thank you for all the great things you've done. Students, I think as you sit here today, you can recognize what real leadership is and what, what a great impact you can have on our region. So thank you and thanks everyone for coming out tonight. And I look forward to some exciting remarks, but even more so probably some very interesting questions from our student body. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lohman. Here's how tonight's program is gonna work. I am about to invite up a Rowan student who will introduce the majority leader. When Majority Leader Greenwald is done with his remarks, I will return to the stage standing over here with some of the questions that many of you submitted when you registered, we had a whole bunch, uh, and many of you uh, might have uh, introduced or wrote a different question and put in the basket outside. And so I'll ask some of those questions of the majority leader so that he can respond and by standing here in front of everybody. So please join me in now welcoming to the stage from the Rowan University class of 2022, Michael Zupka. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Dworkin. As you now know, my name is Michael Zupka. I am a senior economics major from Allentown, New Jersey. It is an honor to be a part of RIPAC and here with you tonight. I am definitely Rowan proud. New Jersey Assembly Majority Leader Lou Greenwald graduated with a degree in political science from Moravian University and then received his JD from Seton Hall Law School. Majority Leader Greenwald was first elected to the Assembly in 1995. In 2012, his peers elected him Majority Leader. This came after serving for nearly a decade as the chair of the Budget Committee. For more than a quarter century, Majority Leader Greenwald has been at the forefront of issues affecting us all, from auto insurance to health care. And on a more personal note, Majority Leader Greenwald shares something in common. Both of our mothers were teachers. And so I understand what it means to be raised by someone who doesn't stop teaching when the school bell rings. The majority leader has often spoken about how much he learned from his beloved mother, a woman taken from this world far too soon. Like me, he learned the value of public service and he has lived with that focus for his entire life. As I prepare to enter the working world following graduation, I hope to live that same kind of life. Fellow students, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome New Jersey's Assembly Majority Leader, the Honorable Lou Greenwald. Thank you, everyone. I am uh, I'm really honored to be here tonight. Michael, that was beautiful. Thank you very much. It's, you know, it's, uh, this is one of the great privileges in public service to be able to come to a classroom, a college, a university, any uh, of our you know, K through 12 school districts, and speak with young people and try to share with you a little bit of what has inspired us to be a part of this. And, and hopefully for those of you who have obviously taken an interest when you could be in a lot of other places on a Thursday night uh, to choose to be here with us, uh, I, I have the highest respect for you and the greatest gratitude that you would choose to spend a part of your evening with us. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate tonight. I've missed doing this, by the way. It's, it's wonderful to be back in person. COVID has robbed us of this a little bit. And I'm, I'm excited and thrilled uh, for Rowan and the work that they've done to make the campus safe, 
uh, to, to open it up for this experience. I have three children myself, all college and graduate school. And you know, when they, my oldest daughter who started her first year of law school and did it online, there is a different experience in being with your classmates and learning, getting that dialogue and that interaction. And the fact that Rowan was at the forefront of saying, we can do this, we can do it safely, we're gonna do it as a community and we're gonna do it well. And it's set an example for, I think, schools not just throughout New Jersey, but around the country. So you should be very proud to be a part of that. I'm joined uh, by my wife tonight. My beautiful, she looks like a third year college student, but uh, you know, so we're happy to have her. And uh, thank you. So, and, we're, and my, my two very uh, dear and close friends, and as Michael talked about the influence of teachers in our lives, uh, my two teachers in high school, Tony and Beth Mancini, are, have been intimately involved in our life and are the godparents to our children. I think it gives you an indication of the role that teachers can play in the lives of young people. And you know, you see Dr. Dworkin as a professor. I, you know, I know him as Ben, and I can tell you the love and the experience that he has for young people to dedicate his life to this profession when he could be doing a lot of other things too. So I'm very honored that he's asked me to participate in this. So Ben, ben wanted to know if I could talk for 25 minutes. I said, Ben, 25 minutes? I mean, I can do that in the shower. So 25 <laughs> minutes. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about, I think, what we would hope for you uh, in this process and what I hope would inspire you to be a part of public policy, politics, and government. Um, you need to bring a passion to this, and everybody's passion is gonna be different. Um, you know, my, I, I, did not, I did not like you. I, I went into, into political science at Moravian because I wanted to go to law school, and I was one of the first in my family to go to college, and if you wanted to be on this track to go to law school, it was recommended uh, to work in programs that would make you think analytically, reason, and that that would be a good pathway for the practice of law. And I grew up in a political family. My mom was elected mayor when I was nine years old, and she was a, she was a trailblazer. She was the first woman ever elected mayor of our town. She was the first woman mayor of Cherry Hill, the 12th largest town in the state. She became the first woman to run county government in the state of New Jersey and ultimately was the first woman surrogate in, in the history of the state of New Jersey. And this was back in 1977. It was, not, it was not common for women to be able to go to the forefront and run for political office, much less lead. And she served with, with honor and grace and distinction and she came from very humble beginnings. She was born in the city of Camden. Her father died when she was three from cancer. She was raised by Italian immigrant grandparents she couldn't afford to go to college. She graduated at the top of her high school class. She couldn't afford to go to college. And in a state like New Jersey at the time, there were no county colleges at that time. So when you think about the remarkable community colleges that we have, that didn't exist for someone like my mother. So she, instead of going to college, went to work for a company called American Acceptance Corporation. And she trained young male executives how to climb the corporate ladder of success. That was her job. That was a ladder that she would never be permitted in that company to step on herself. And ironically, through fate and fortune, young man came through that office one day, they met, they fell in love, and that was my father. They got married, they had uh, two children, my brother and myself, and they decided, like many people who had born and raised in the city of Camden, their idea of success was to buy a little plot of land and move to the suburbs, and that's what they did. And they moved to a home on Mansfield Boulevard in Cherry Hill, and they were pregnant with me. And that's where they lived their entire lives. And it was at that house, it was the first snowy day of January, January 11th of 1995. She was on her way to a funeral for a friend of ours, Senator Walter Rand, and she was a tenth of a mile from our home. And she took her eyes off the road for a second. If she'd have had a seatbelt on, she'd have walked away from the accident. And she lost her life in that accident. And it was the most tragic day for me and for my family. She was the single greatest role model in my life. And she was, uh, she, when she would go through the community, she touched people's lives in a very unique way. And she served in public service, not as a lawyer or as someone who had some other ambition. She served as a poor kid from the city of Camden. His father died when she was three, couldn't speak the English language when she went to elementary school, ultimately became Americanized and couldn't afford to go to college. And she served in the light of, if it could happen to her, it could happen to anyone. She governed through a model of life experiences. 
And when she passed away, the campaign against her when she ran for the first time, by the way, is interesting. We all think these negative campaigns are something new and we're disgusted by them and they bother us. The campaign when she ran for the first time in 1977 was she's nothing more than a mom. Could you imagine saying that today? And it was, it was a subtle attack on her lack of education and that she couldn't afford to go to college. She won, became a legend. And the headline in the paper the day after the accident coming full circle was a community had lost its mother. And it wasn't Democratic mayor or Democratic freeholder. It was a community had lost its mother. And you're young and you have your beliefs and we encourage that. And I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. I care that you bring passion to what you do. And the reality is that I would say to you, my passion for public service, I was a fan. I was a fan as a child growing up. When I was your age, I was a fan. Like some of you, I was more interested and I had worked on campaigns and run campaigns, but I wasn't thinking of going and putting my name on that ballot. I had ironically been asked the year before to run for Congress against Congressman Saxton. And I had said, no, my mother was still alive. I was very supportive of hers, but I, was, I graduated from law school and I was starting my practice. When she passed away and I stood at that viewing at St. Pius X Church on Crescent Road in Cherry Hill, and 6,000 people from all walks of life stood in line for five hours to walk by that coffin and pay respects, to literally reach out and touch the hand of a woman who used those hands to, to lift them up in time of need. It was at that moment when friends in the party came to me and said, this community is mourning, please consider running. And so I did, I ran, and I ran with a passion. I was, I was mourning, the community was mourning, but I knocked on over 10,000 doors. And no one, at that, no one was asking me to come and speak at a community like Rowan University. No one was asking me to go to the chamber and talk to business leaders. I had to connect with people one at a time on their doorstep. And I went door to door and met with folks and talked to them about the issues that mattered to them. And that's how I connected. And I fast forward an entire year. That following November, I got elected. And I was the first member of my party in 25 years to hold that seat. And I hope nothing as tragic happens to you as it did to me in losing my mother, but I hope something inspires you with the same passion to want you to get involved and make a difference. And the issues that we're gonna talk about tonight, I think what I would say to you, and the reason why I say, I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican, I want you to bring, bring passion to the debate. Because the issues that we talk about tonight, they're not Democrat or Republican issues. They're issues that affect people from all walks of life. And to solve those problems, you need to bring passion. And I think what troubles me the most about public service and politics today and why I continue to do this and come meet with folks like you and try to set you on a path to understand what I think is a model of success to be successful in this business. If you have asked me to come here and you think that I've done something that has been successful or that I am recognized by people around the state or a university like yours that says that this is someone who's been successful at this business, it is having an open mind and not believing that I have all the solutions to everybody's problems. But by together, working with people, listening to people, be a good listener, think critically. Don't assume that you know what you don't know and take in other people's ideas. Because if you approach problems with the concept and the idea that we know what the problem is, it's easy to identify the problem. It's hard to identify solutions. Everybody can tell you what's wrong. Everybody loves to complain. Not everybody's willing to roll up their sleeves and figure out how you solve those problems. And let me tell you something, we have plenty, but we're not alone. And the reality is, if you're willing to work hard, if you're willing to be open-minded, if you're willing to work across party lines, you can solve, there's no problem that you can't solve. There's not a single problem in this state that is not solvable if people are willing to work together. And I'm gonna give you some examples of that. And one of the things that Professor Dworkin asked me to talk to you about tonight are issues that are present today in New Jersey. And I'm gonna tell you that the most important issue that's present today in New Jersey, it only happens once a decade. It happens once every 10 years, and it's redistricting. And you're gonna see a lot about redistricting in the news from states around the country. And I will tell you that we don't talk about this much, and it's easy for me to say, because I was on the redistricting committee 20 years ago, and I lent uh, advice as a consultant 10 years ago, and being asked to come in again uh, now this year. New Jersey has the best redistricting program in the country. Now, not many people know that, but when you watch other states and how they are gerrymandered in a negative way, New Jersey's system has created a map 
that reacts and reflects the will of the voters. And in preparing for tonight, some of our staff prepared some comments. And one of the comments that they talked about was that the Democratic Party had won the last two maps. That's not true. The Democrats and the Republicans don't win the maps. You know, there's a theory that the Republicans will win this map this year because the Democrats lost. That's not true. The principle of redistricting is very simply done by following certain pieces of evidence that drive us to how those maps should be created. And here's where politics plays in the redistricting, in a positive way. If you have good politics, not Democrat or Republican politics, but if you have politics that are driven by public policy that the will of the people get behind, those people come out and vote for candidates, either Democrat or Republican, because they believe in those principles. And it is those principles that craft the framework of whether Democrats or Republicans get elected. And that's what the voters are supporting. The voters are the people that win the map. And the reason why I know this to be true is because when there have been knee-jerk reactions over the last 20 years during certain election cycles, whether it was an historic event like the first African-American president being elected in this country and an enthusiasm and from my generation, it was our Kennedy moment, the Democratic Party had a jump. When President Trump was elected and there was some revolt against some of his stances and his positions and maybe some of his rhetoric, there was a reflection back and the Democratic Party gained seats. When Governor Murphy, as a Democrat, took public policy and may have swung too far to the left in this last election, that map that some would say Democrats won reacted appropriately because the state said, no, you're going too far. And they wanted to bring us back to where they, as voters, believe we should be. Now, why is this important? Th those principles, when I served on this 20 years ago, I was in the minority party. First Democrat in, in 25 years to be elected to my seat. I was in a split district. I wasn't supposed to win. I, you know when I knew I was going to win the election? It was the Monday night before the election. And I had knocked on those 10,000 doors, and I had stayed at train stations for two weeks in the morning, helping people onto the train and shaking their hand and handing out literature, trying to get that last vote. And I remember thinking, this is going to be close. And a young man who was working for my opponent came up to me on, the, on that Monday morning, and he said, Mr. Greenwald, I have to tell you, I feel so bad for you. You're going to lose, and you're going to lose big. And he said, but you work so hard. He said, you know, you're, you're what we need in government. I hope you don't give up. And I said, well, thank you for that. I said, I appreciate the kind words. But I had seen polling that it was close, and I knew it was going to be close. And I knew from going door to door that it was going to be close. That night, we're sports fans in our household. It was Monday night. We were watching Monday night football. The Eagles were playing. I will never forget it. And on Monday night football on national TV, a commercial came on about me. And I remember turning to my wife and saying, we're going to win. And she said, well, how do you know that? I said, nobody is spending all this money on Monday night football if I'm not going to win this race. And, we, and lo and behold, we won. But winning is just the first step. So when you get in, and what are you going to do with that now that you're there? So this redistricting is critically important because you, are now, you now need to take those policies that you've put into place for the last 10 years and use that to make sure, and one of the, some of the key principles that we fight for, and it, what is important in redistricting is regional representation. So you're in a state of 9.3 million people. There's roughly 3 million people in the southern part of the state. Out of 9.3 million people, only 120 residents in the state of New Jersey get the privilege to serve in the state legislature. 120. It is a remarkable honor. But each of us represent roughly 232,000 people in our district. So you have 40 legislative districts representing 232,000 people. Now the population, the census says, that South Jersey has lost population, although when we did this 10 years ago, we were 8.7 million people. So 8.7 million to 9.3, South Jersey has gained residents, but maybe less than other parts of the state. And what feeds into the redistricting model from a policy standpoint that is important for you as young people to understand is the census. You know, a lot of people, how many people fill out the census, throw the census away? If you don't fill out the census and you're not counted and you're not registered, South Jersey now stands to lose seats to the north because of what appears to be a loss of population. And why does that matter? When I started my career in the minority, 
and in 2001, we went into the majority. I worked very closely in the minority with friends of mine from South Jersey, like Republican Senator Bill Gormley, Republican Speaker Jack Collins. Because whatever our beliefs might have been from a partisan standpoint, fighting for South Jersey was critically important. And when governors elected, Governor McGreevy and then Governor Christie, a Democrat and a Republican, elected to eliminate a reciprocity agreement with Pennsylvania, that meant 180,000 New Jersey households were gonna pay more in income tax by doing away with that. And we in South Jersey were able to stand up and withhold votes, say that's not happening here. You're not passing your budget problems onto the southern part of the state and our, and our residents. When we fought for 30 years, this is the only office I've held for 26 years, my mother before me and our friends before us fought for 30 years for a medical school in South Jersey. And my friend Dana Redd, who's here with me and is the mayor of the city of Camden, was the mayor of the city of Camden, served with me in the state legislature, will tell you, pe people actually said this. This wasn't 50 years ago. People said 15 years ago, why do you need a medical school? You can go over the bridge to Jefferson. You can go over the bridge to Pennsylvania. Well, let me tell you, doctors that go to medical school, they're not Republican or Democrat. They don't treat sick Republicans or sick Democrats. They treat people, and we have a shortage of 5,000 primary care physicians in this state. And so what is one of the policy issues that we're working on right now? We're working on a public policy initiative to build School of Osteopathic Medicine with Virtual Hospital in Rowan to make sure that we can attack that issue of a shortage of primary care physicians because primary care doctors are the gateway to healthcare and keeping people healthy. And why is that important? And for all the obvious reasons, but one of the things that is staggering and upsetting and tragic is that in a state like New Jersey, it's one of the wealthiest states in the country, highest per capita income, number one public education system in the country, we have an infant mortality rate and a maternal mortality rate that rivals a third world country. And it is worse in certain areas of South Jersey where we have higher levels of obesity amongst our children, higher teen pregnancy, we have issues of maternal mortality in minority communities, and not what you would just think in urban areas, but minority communities that have been educated are now young professionals and have moved to suburbs, but whatever it was in their childhood, their culture, their lack of access to healthcare because of a demographic of coming in the South have not received certain care or prenatal care. These are issues that are driven by redistricting and representation. These are, so there was an article in the newspaper today about bridges, very boring. And 7,000 bridges in the state of New Jersey. 7.1% of those bridges are critically failing and you drive over them every day. And there's an article, and it was interesting, I re and I read things in a, as a, with a lawyer's mind trying to think critically and analytically. So I read the article, and I didn't look for Democratic bridges or Republican bridges. What did I look for? I looked for bridges in the North and bridges in the South. And the article only talked about bridges in the north. Well, all you got to do is get on 295 to come here tonight and you see where that roadway collapsed. I would say that's failing, right? And we just worked in a bipartisan effort with our congressional delegation to get federal funding for infrastructure development. And one of the things that we are going to fight for is to make sure that South Jersey gets their fair share. So now within the Democratic Party, you know, you have partisan divides and then you have divides within your own party. Well, recently, some of you, I'm sure, have read this because you guys are like us political animals. Our friend from South Jersey, the representative for the geographical region for South Jersey, Steve Sweeney, who represented this region, was removed from the redistricting committee. And a lovely young lady who I know, I, I, I knew her parents well, her father represented Rowan University, David Matos at the time. She's smart as a wet, good, talented young kid, young lady. She's the representative. Steve Sweeney was replaced with Ms. Matos. Ms. Matos doesn't live in South Jersey. And so South Jersey right now, as we sit, does not have a representative representing these districts that know these communities, that drive through these towns, that understand if you move one town to another and what does it mean, and about our population. And maybe doesn't have the ability to talk about from South Jersey where there has been population growth, but certain communities of interest were, were hindered in responding to the census and maybe were underrepresented. We need to now make sure, and we're gonna step forward, and you know, I worked, the state chairman 
someone who I've worked with in the past, have great respect for, served with me in the state legislature 20 years ago. And you know, we've reached out to him and we've been asked again, as I said in the beginning, to add advice because I did this 20 years ago. And start to raise issues about how do you make sure that there is fair representation? Because there is a difference of approach between Democrats and Republicans to redistricting. When I did this 20 years ago, the Republican Party put forward initiatives that said people needed to be in communities like themselves that were reflective of themselves. And that if you were African American or Latino, you wouldn't be able to get elected unless you had a majority population of people that looked like you and had your experiences and came from your culture. We said we disagreed with that. We fought hard against that. We said that you could tear down these walls and that we lived in a world where if you found the right candidates, regardless of color, regardless of sex, those, those people of color, regardless of sex, could get elected in suburban communities. And whether it was Dana Red, or whether it was Senator Nielsa Cruz Perez as the first, one of the first Latino senators in the state, whether it was in the seventh legislative district where representing Burlington County, where we represented Dr. Herb Conaway and Troy Singleton as African-Americans and a female candidate in Carol Murphy, we showed that we could tear down barriers and that good candidates with good ideas, regardless of party, could win in communities as long as it was balanced and fair. In the fourth legislative district, a young woman by the name of Gabby Mascara, Latino, would have been a Dream Act kid if came to this country today. She is by every definition a Dream Act child. She has a pot, she's Latino. She has a population of less than 2% Latinos and she gets elected to the New Jersey General Assembly because she's right on the policy for her district. She communicates well with her residents. She works hard and she's available and she is connected to the community. And regardless of party, that is, that is the opportunity you can have. And I just wanna give you a, a couple of stats, and this is why I'm excited about where New Jersey is and how far we've come with this. We have a, right now, for the first time, the assembly leadership in New Jersey is a majority female. So the spirit of Maria Greenwald lives, lives well. 45% of New Jersey residents are people of color. We have had dramatic growth in our legislature and people of color. Right now, out of 120, 79 are men, that's four fewer than last session, 41 are women, that's four more than last session, 84 members are white, that's four fewer than last session, 19 are black, 10 are Hispanic, that's one more from last session, and our fastest growing community, certainly in the, South, in the 6th District in South Jersey, six are Asian American and that's doubled from the last session. And we continue to see that growth, which we should be very proud of. And that is reflective of the work that this map does. And last session in the assembly, there were 52 Democratic members, but after a reaction to certain policies from Governor Murphy, not that the Democrats lost the majority, they should, the Governor Murphy got reelected, but the Democrats went from 52 seats to 46. It was a reaction back. And it is a question of whether or not you are listening to your constituents and their needs. But I'll just, I'll close with this, and then we'll take some questions. When I say that you have to have an open mind and be open to public policy, I became the champion of gun violence reform in New Jersey. And my family owns guns. My parents, my uh, in-laws are farmers, they have guns. We, are, we support the Second Amendment, not looking to eliminate the Second Amendment. Um, but I met the families from Sandy Hook. I met the parents of Sandy Hook, whose children were senselessly killed by an assault weapon with armor-piercing bullets. 20 children lost their lives with someone who could fire a gun and shoot multiple people without reloading. And it was, uh, it was a magazine capacity that held 50 rounds. And I'll never forget, I came home on a Sunday from church and my kids were still home with us. They hadn't left for college yet. And it was the summer and I went in and I was gonna watch the Phillies game. And from my generation, you guys are too young to remember this, but from my generation, this remarkable manager, tough as nails, salty, bigger than a mountain, Dallas Green comes on the screen and they're interviewing him before the game. So I call my kids into the room 
and I said, guys, come, they're going to talk about the 1980 Phillies when they won the World Series. This was the team that I watched growing up. So the kids come running into the room, and I'm watching Dallas Green, and he's being interviewed. And all of a sudden, this mountain of a man starts to cry. And I realize they're not talking about baseball. And he starts to talk about when Congresswoman Gifford was shot at a strip mall in Arizona. And I connected with that immediately because when my mom was running, she would take me to the Woodcrest Shopping Center where she would go shopping and we would be at that strip mall and everybody wanted to come and touch her, just be in her presence for a minute. And going to the supermarket with my mom was a three hour ordeal. You didn't want to do that when you were 14, but everybody wanted to stop and touch her. Well, Dallas Green's granddaughter loved politics and she wanted to, like you, she wanted to pursue a career in government. And she was, she was like 11 or 14 years old. And her parents took her to see Congresswoman Gifford in Arizona. And as I watched the interview with Dallas Green, Dallas Green said, you know what the difference is? You know the difference between a magazine capacity that holds 10 and 15 when your granddaughter is shot with the 13 bullet in that chamber. And I started to work on public policy because of that experience and the experience of working with the families from Sandy Hook. And when you start to understand, do you need a magazine capacity with 50 rounds? You're not taking away anyone's gun. You just have to reload, reload after 10 rounds. And when you started to break down barriers and talk to people about, okay, listen, I understand you want to protect the Second Amendment. We're not going to take away anyone's gun. But we want to work on this because these families say, who have lost the most precious thing in their life, you can make this difference. And when you start to look at public opinion polls, over 70% of people in the state of New Jersey support that legislation. They support background checks. They support common sense legislation for gun reform, not to take guns away. And the credibility that we've earned on this issue as a Democrat, and this is very important, we have stopped, I have stopped, I have, singly, I have singularly stopped legislation that has come forward where people have tried to take guns away because then you lose the credibility on and it's about having common sense approaches to this legislation. But you have to have an open mind. You have to be willing to talk to people across party lines. I, I did not get into public policy, into the legislature and the politics, thinking that this would be an issue that I would address. That was an, is that was an issue that history presented to me. And then the last one was, I came full circle on legislation about legalizing marijuana. So this is an issue that is now coming through in the, in the the cannabis commission that has been established because we wanted to take it out of the hands of government because we have no experience in this as a citizen's legislature and we brought in people to help. They are now starting to, they're gonna get ready to roll out the rules on how we will sell marijuana legally in New Jersey. And I got involved in this issue. I was very against it. I was, had struggled with this issue. My wife and I would talk about it, talk about it with my kids. I was concerned that we couldn't tell how much was in your system when we leave here tonight and we get in our car, it's not like alcohol where there's a blood alcohol content. We can tell whether or not you're impaired. I was concerned about children between the ages of 15 and 21 where it can do permanent damage. These were the issues that I had. So I went in with an open mind. Some of my friends were representing the groups that wanted to legalize marijuana. And we talked about the same impact that marijuana had on the brain as alcohol did. And I said, okay, well, let's check that box. And then we started to talk about how we would train police and not get in issues of racial profiling that we've dealt with over our career here in New Jersey, but how we would use proper training to determine whether or not someone had been impaired while they were getting behind the wheel. So we checked off that box with a lot of work. We went to, we went to Colorado, we went to Denver. And this was a funny stat, but a troubling stat to me. The issue, uh, auto accidents went up after they legalized marijuana in Colorado. Road rage went down, for whatever that's worth. So that was an interesting statistic that I thought. But ultimately, why I got behind legalizing marijuana was because we had a friend uh, who played baseball with our son, whose older brother became addicted to opioids after he was exposed to painkillers after having a wisdom teeth pulled. And he battled addiction for a while. And he was clean and sober for three years. And he, he relapsed one day. 
He didn't relapse hard. He went and he bought marijuana uh, illegally on the black market off the street. And it was laced with fentanyl. And he died. He woke up the next, uh, the next morning. His parents woke up, went down to the family room, and he was dead in the, in the rec room. And I came to realize and open my mind that I didn't know all the answers to this and that while I had preconceived positions on this, I also came to realize as a father and as someone who had watched this young man grow up that this can happen to anybody and that this is a dangerous product as it is and it is getting more dangerous and that if we could actually get our arms around and have the ability to regulate it, we might be able to make it safer. So I'm not telling you all the issues are easy. And when, when you look at the voting sessions and you track what we do in Trenton, the things that pass 80 to nothing, making May Butterfly Month, yeah, that passes 80 to nothing, right? It's the hard issues over the courses of our career that sometimes we look back on now and say, boy, why was that so hard? Banning smoking in public places. Why was that? So you guys are so young, you don't even remember when you would walk in and someone would say smoking or non-smoking, right? But that was a major issue. We tackled it in a bipartisan fashion. We eliminated smoking in public places. It has huge health benefits now. And we don't even think about those things anymore. And we will get there with these other issues, and you can solve these problems. But no one party has a monopoly on good ideas. No individual has a monopoly on good ideas. And the best public policy is the policy that we've done together. So thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you, Mr. Majority Leader. I greatly appreciate those comments and, and your personal take on, on so many of the issues of the day. Really appreciate those insights. So we have a bunch of questions that came from uh, folks when they registered, they submitted them. Uh, I'm gonna run through them, they kind of run the gamut. So let's see what we can get to. The first one was really just about your overall priorities. I mean, you talked about uh, the need for primary care physicians. You talked about your commitment to uh, ending gun violence uh, and, uh, and certain aspects of common sense uh, gun control. But can you talk, you know, perhaps what are your top five legislative priorities for this next session? So this last election, there was a, there was a much seen commercial of Governor Murphy saying, if taxes are your issue and you're a one issue candidate, if you're a one-issue candidate and taxes are your issue, New Jersey's not the right state for you. That comment was taken out of context. It was talking about the millionaire's tax, which affected less than 1% of the population. But that, con that single comment drove frustration with New Jersey residents more than any else. And I will tell you that it resonates with me because when I ran in 1995, the two most important issues in New Jersey were auto insurance costs and access and property taxes. And to my point to you earlier, there is no problem that you can't solve. We solved New Jersey's highest auto insurance rates. New Jersey at the time had over 800,000 uninsured drivers. Just in the last quarter, there was a study done nationwide. New Jersey has the lowest number of uninsured drivers in the country. We solved a significantly difficult issue where New Jersey led all states in the country. We do not, we cannot get the political will to solve the property tax crisis in this state. And I've talked about it for 26 years. So when people ask me, what, what is the number one issue? That auto insurance issue and property taxes, it's one word, affordability. And what frustrates me about property taxes in New Jersey is it is the single most discriminatory tax there is. And I want you to think about it this way. So we fund all of our local governments. We're the only state in the country that funds all of our local governments by one revenue source, and that's property taxes. We offset some of it with income tax for public education, but we, can't, we don't generate enough. We spend somewhere over $30 billion a year on public education, and we generate about $14 billion in income tax. The rest is coming from property taxes. And here's why it's discriminatory. In 2008, when there was an economic tsunami and people lost their inheritance, they lost their uh, retirement accounts, the property taxes were blinded to it and they went up. 
you guys just lived through one of the worst healthcare and economic impacts from healthcare in the last hundred years. New, unemployment in New Jersey went to 17%. People, seven, that means 17% of the population lost their jobs. Maybe even some of your families. When you lose your job, what do you lose? You lose your health insurance. And in New Jersey, 567 towns, 608 school districts, while the people that pay their bills through property taxes were hurting, losing their jobs, afraid they were gonna lose their job, lost their health insurance, their property taxes went up because it's blinded to the economic reality. So the number one issue for me, and it has been for 26 years, is to restructure how we fund local governments. And it doesn't mean take money away, but restructure where that base comes from. So that's a hard conversation, and this is why people don't have the political courage to do it. It means having a conversation around where else you would go, income, sales, corporate business tax, sin taxes, to go find revenue to fund those resources. But here's why I think that's a better means by which to do it. We talked about how property taxes were blinded to these events. If I increase someone's sin tax on cigarettes or alcohol and I lose my job, I can make a decision. Do I really need that alcohol? Do I, maybe I should, maybe it's now the time to stop smoking without health insurance. When you have to worry about having a roof over your head for you and your children and your property taxes continue to go up, it's not hard to realize that ripple effect of why New Jersey has some of the highest foreclosure rates in the country. So there are a couple things that impact our ability to solve this problem. New Jersey is what we call a home rule state where everybody says, you know what, Mr. Greenwald, that's a great idea. Just don't do that in my community. But the rest of them are wasting their money. Do it over there, right? But no one wants to touch theirs. And the reality is everybody in a political world in which we live, no one will talk about the benefit, the economic engine, the competitive nature of where New Jersey would be if we could lower our property taxes versus the political reality that you will be labeled for increasing the others in that next campaign. And that's what stymies it. But if we could get people together in a bipartisan fashion, we could solve the problem. I'll just close with this. We did this on gas tax, right? So the Transportation Trust Fund was bankrupt. And that money comes from a gas tax. And the gas tax needed to be raised. And New Jersey had the lowest gas tax in the country, and lower than all of our neighboring states. And we worked with a Republican Senator, Steve Orho, and myself, and Senator Sweeney, and Eliana Pintermarin from North Jersey, a Democrat. We worked at increasing the gas tax to fund the Transportation Trust Fund. But we wanted to be smart about it, and we took that opportunity to lower some other taxes to make New Jersey more competitive around inheritance and estate taxes and to give benefits to veterans and to take for our public workers who in New Jersey would pay an income tax on their retirement incomes but didn't in other states. So they dedicated their whole lives here. We paid for their benefits on property taxes and when they retired, we created every incentive for them to move to another state. So we readjusted that so that we could be competitive with New Jersey. When we had the problem with the Transportation Trust Fund, we had a D minus rating for our roads and bridges by the National Engineer Society in the country. After we fixed it, we've gone up to a C. It takes a long time to make those improvements. But you, if you could solve that problem and get bipartisan support, you can do it on property tax. Let me uh, follow up on property taxes because one of the questions that was kind of interesting that we came here um, was dealing with it not necessarily from a statewide perspective, but allowing municipalities to have some flexibility in how they generate money. Uh, so the question was really to reduce and not just manage local property taxes. One idea that, that has been floated periodically is to allow municipalities to generate their own revenue through an income tax in their own town, sales tax, uh, their own sales tax that just goes to them or some kind of alternative tax. And the idea would be to make this revenue neutral for the town. So whatever gets raised by this alternative tax reduces the local property tax by the same amount. What's your take on this idea, allowing towns sort of that kind of flexibility? Is this something that should be done? So I don't know where they got the idea or the question, but this is something that, this is what I have uh, espoused for the last 15 years as the public policy solution for this. Um, so I don't know, my wife and I, when we were younger, we, 
the real estate industry hated us because we would go through every open house, right? And we, we weren't going to buy a house, but we were going through open houses to get ideas for what to do with our house. And inevitably, because of what I do for a living, I would always ask, what are the property taxes? And when you compared those property taxes, if you were looking at it from a policy mind, we started to look up on Zillow, okay, what would a similar house and a similar price range cost in Bucks County? And then you'd look at those property taxes. So if you went over the bridge to Bucks County, Pennsylvania, you just leave Lambertville in the middle, central part of our state outside the capital, go right over to Bucks County in the New Hope, you could go from six tenths of an acre, half an acre of land, home that my wife and I live on, we live on six tenths of an acre, four bedroom, two car garage. When we built our home 24 years ago, our property taxes at the time were a mind numbing $10,200. Four bedroom, two car garage, half an acre, a little more than half an acre, okay? It was a 3,800 square foot home, 4,300 when the basement was finished. We haven't added an inch to the house. All we've done is improve it. In 24 years, our taxes have gone from $10,200 to $24,000. Now let me tell you why that worries me for you. When my wife and I had our oldest child, when she was one years old, we built that home. And $10,200 for two young professionals, a lawyer and a speech pathologist, was a lot of money, but we knew our career, we were working hard, our careers were growing, we had a, we had a trajectory for where we wanted to go. So we made, an, we made a smart investment in the home. That, I was, I was uh, 31 when we bought the home. The 31-year-old Greenwald family of today can't buy that home because they're not gonna pay $24,000. So what has that done? Well, we're not looking to move, so it's okay. But the value of our home has gone down. So the, the largest investment that you will ever make in your life has gone down in value because we're not addressing that problem. But if we went over the bridge to Bucks County, we have a friend who lives over there. They live on five acres, same home. It's got a beautiful babbling brook in the back where we literally saw a deer drinking out of the babbling brook. Their home, four bedroom, two car garage, five acres of land, we're paying $12,000 a year in property taxes because they have a local 1% income tax. Now, what would we do with that? So the professor said it right. We would take every penny of that local option, a 1% income tax, and we would, it would mandate that it come off the property tax levy. So our taxes at 24,000 would come down. I would probably also entertain either eliminating, right now we have what's called a 2% cap. So you can't raise the property taxes by more than 2%. I would probably entertain reducing that cap to zero or nominal. And then people will say, well then, how would, you, how would you invest in the next contract negotiation? Health benefits for employees go up. You have to make investment in the infrastructure into the facilities. We would go into a period of time where we would freeze spending, offset it with the local option, and then let's say in 24 months, allow, as it has routinely, as our economy grows and income tax revenue goes up, to be able, that organic growth could be used to expand education programs, expand contracts and benefits for public workers, but now you're growing within your means, just like every household has to do in New Jersey. And why does that matter? Well, let's go back to September 11th, when we were attacked and New Jersey was hit hard and our stock market dropped, the economic tsunami of 2008, COVID, Superstorm Sandy. In every one of those four events, the economy took a hit. Households in New Jersey were hurt financially. Our revenue dipped and everybody's property taxes went up. It's cruel, it's discriminatory. It's led to the highest foreclosure rates in the country. It's led to the highest out migration of graduating high school seniors in the country. New Jersey exports one third of our graduating high school seniors. When they leave, they go to another state to get their education, instead of coming here, 90% of them don't come back. 
and you, you see it with your parents and your grandparents who ultimately relocate to other states. And I'll just, I'll leave you with this. The number one state, the number one state that people leave New Jersey and go to, everybody thinks it's Florida. It's not Florida. Everybody thinks it's South Carolina. It is not South Carolina. Everybody thinks it's Delaware, where they don't charge taxes for anything. The number one state that people leave New Jersey and relocate to is Pennsylvania. And the second state is New York. And so when people talk about, well, New York has the highest income tax, and we're getting close to that, they say, they're not leaving. That, that income tax isn't threatening people to go to New York. It's why people are leaving New Jersey, in my mind, is because you're a consumer, we're a consumer-driven society. And if I can get the same thing for less money, I'm going to do it. And that's what ultimately has happened. So I, I think this is an issue that's solvable. And I think, and this is where I come back to what I said to you guys. I'm not telling you that my idea is the only good idea, but that's what I would advocate for, certainly as a foundational piece to it. And then anything else that we would want to add to that, we should do. But I would not sacrifice. We should be proud that we are the number one public education system in this country three years in a row. And that comes from the investment we make. So we want to make a commitment that we're going to do it in a revenue neutral way, but that we're going to do it in a way that doesn't discriminate against young people, homeowners, and senior citizens that want to retire. And you can do that. Mr. Majority Leader, one of the, we had a couple other questions about South Jersey. And since you talked about it in your remarks, this will build on what you've already said. One of the uh, specific issues in the area is that there were many who had high hopes for the Glassboro to Camden light rail line. Um, Senator Sweeney was obviously a very big uh, proponent of this. How do you see its future? Um, is that something that's, that's a decade off? Is that something that might come sooner? What's yeah. your take? I, I think the future on that is bright. And this is why redistricting matters, OK? Um, I think that the money in the federal stimulus dollars, that $12 billion that have come to New Jersey, is revenue. A part of that can be used for the light rail line from, from Camden to Gloucester. And that rail line, is Senator Sweeney was a massive advocate for it, as was Senator Redd when she was there, as in myself and our colleagues, because it runs through all of our districts. And it, it helps the environment. It helps with congestion. I had a meeting earlier uh, in Philadelphia coming here. It was a 17-mile ride from Philadelphia to here. It took me an hour and 10 minutes, right? It would have been a lot easier to get on the light rail line, the high-speed line from Philly to Camden, go from Camden to Gloucester, and I could have read the newspaper along the way, right? It would have been, I still read the newspaper, I know. So that, I would say to you that that's important. But you know, whether it's infrastructure, I, this, I want you to understand where you guys live, right? Whether it's infrastructure, whether it's the light rail line, Rowan University is the second largest university in the state. Second largest university in the state. You have the number two osteopathic school in the country. That's yours. Rowan Medical School is in the top 10 medical schools in the country. They receive 7,000 applications a year for 300 slots. In our undergraduate program at Rowan, the average student receives $2,600 a year from the state per head. Rutgers receives, Rutgers, New Brunswick, and North Jersey receives over $6,000 per student per head. So if you want to understand why getting involved, I, there are Democrat and Republican students here. There are Democrat and Republican students at Rutgers. If you want to understand why getting involved and fighting for fairness in your region and why you stand up, why you see us stand up for issues of South Jersey, it is because I would put our abilities and our talents up against anybody. I certainly would put mine up against any of my other 120 colleagues in the state of New Jersey. I don't think because we come from South Jersey, I should be paid 40% less than someone from the northern part of the state. So whether it's infrastructure or your education or the investment in these schools, there, there should be a balance, there should be a fairness test and, and it should be based on outcomes, too. If you're outperforming people from other regions of the state, the money should come to where the outcomes are, are being performed. We've got about 10 minutes more, so we just want to run through a, a, a couple of final things here. Um, we had several questions about the pandemic. 
Um, and just, they came in two parts, so maybe I'm gonna ask it together. One was sort of what's happening right now. Are there things we should be changing that you would advocate to the governor, to the Department of Health? We should be doing something differently today. And then the second part of the question is, is this now just become part of our lives that we just have to accept? At what point are we not gonna beat this thing? What's your take on this, both the short term and long term? Sure. So I'm gonna give you the same advice I give my kids. And you know, I'm, I'm not even I'm not gonna to talk to you today in this question as the assemblyman. I'm gonna tell you as someone as a lawyer who ninety percent of my business is in healthcare. This virus This virus was the most serious healthcare crisis that we have faced in the last 100 years. Make no mistake about it. This was the leading cause of death amongst police officers in this country, was COVID. The leading cause of death amongst police officers. It was in the top three causes of death with cancer and uh, with cardiac. And I think the mistake that was made as someone who has become considered an expert in healthcare and healthcare policy and healthcare business. Somewhere along the lines, the rhetoric of politics superseded what was common sense and science. And in a rush and, and everybody reacting throughout, people that would say, um, if you get the vaccine, you're not gonna get sick. That's not true. Many of you have gotten the flu vaccine in your life. Well, you can still get the flu, but it's not gonna, your parents tell you to get the flu shot, the school requires you to get the flu shot, because if you get the flu, it's not gonna take you out for four weeks and you're gonna fall behind in your studies and you're gonna waste the investment that you put into this year's college education. It's about you and making smart decisions. This vaccine is a medical miracle. It is a medical miracle. The, the Trump administration working with the pharmaceutical industry and the speed with which this developed is a governmental and medical scientific research and development phenomenon. And it saved millions of lives in this country and hundreds of millions of lives worldwide. If you look at history, this virus is following the same course that other viruses have gone through. The virus wants to survive. It can't kill off all its hosts. It, has to, it wants to survive. It's a living thing that wants to survive. So this last variant was very contagious, 70% more contagious than the original strand, but far less deadly because it is mutating in a way that will allow it to survive. Now, part of why it's successful in, in diminishing in its severity is because of the effectiveness of these vaccines. And if you look at the numbers on campus where this campus has mandated vaccines, and if you look at all three of my kids' campuses where they mandated the vaccines for faculty, staff, and students, minor breakthroughs, and when there are breakthroughs, inconsequential ultimate illnesses. That's what the vaccine was intended to do. Stop you from being hospitalized, stop you from dying and protecting others. That's what it was intended to do. I believe from the work that I do in science and in healthcare, this vaccine is now, this is I think the last hurrah. The one thing we've learned about this vaccine is that we don't know what we don't know and what's coming next. But if it follows the course of history, this is the last major wave. If there is another variant and a surge, it will probably be less virulent. And, there will, and I think the question of whether or not this is the new normal, I, this virus is here to stay, but it is manageable. If you get flu shots, you should get a, a vaccine for this. There is a vaccine that will be out in the next year to 18 months that will be for flu and COVID. So you'll get one shot um, and we will get through this. And, we, and you know, hopefully what we have learned from this is the development and manufacturing of uh, the mask and, and personal protection equipment, we won't, won't rely on another country for it. We will have surpluses of these. And, um, 
and we will be okay. And, the, and so the work of the Trump administration working with pharma to develop this should be applauded. And the work of the Biden administration and local governments to distribute the vaccine at places like Rowan should be applauded. It was, it was almost a military exercise with tremendous precision. So I think we are at the tail end of this. I don't, I want you to live your lives and pursue your dreams. And I will tell you as a father of three children, we told them their whole lives, this is gonna be the best four years of your life. And I know it feels like two of those years have been robbed from you. Um, but you, you're, you're I, and it's easy for us to say, you're gonna be better and you're gonna be stronger for this. And if you truly wanna get into government and public policy, there, I can't tell you what that crisis is in the future, but you're gonna be better equipped to represent people going forward because of your experience and what you went through. Mr. Majority Leader, I'll ask you one final question, and it's something we ask all of our speakers who come here and want to thank you again. Uh, you ran for office when you were in your 20s, not much older than many of our students here tonight. What do you know now that you wish you knew then? Hmm. What do I know now that I wish I knew then? Ben, that's a great question. I would say um, I'm better at the job now because I didn't know what I didn't know then. You know, I, you're juniors and seniors. Are you better students today than when, when you walked in here as freshmen for the first time? You thought you knew what you were getting into, right? You're better at it today than you were then. Um, when I, wa I was elected, I was 28 years old and I was scared to death. I was Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. I remember thinking I was driving up there and I was surrounded by really talented, bright people. So there was this guy, John Adler, who went to Harvard, he was Harvard, Harvard, right? And there was my friend, Joe Roberts, who went on to be the majority leader and speaker and one of my mentors. And I'd watched these people grow up. I, as I was growing up, I'd watched them as adults. And I was the kid with the baseball hat on backwards, throwing a ball up against the wall while I was watching them do what I'm doing now. And then overnight, I was their equal and I was serving them. And I think what I've gotten, I've gotten far better at is being curious about new ideas and solutions. So the great thing about our government is we're a citizen's legislature. So we bring our careers and our life experience to the job. So being an attorney that specializes in healthcare, it's been a really interesting time through this pandemic intellectually to live through this and be a part of it and to try to offer solutions. But I didn't know this was coming. So that's a benefit that I had from my career. But what I've enjoyed the most was issues that I my career would have never taken me to, but I was able to get involved in the debate and the policy uh, because I was there. And I, I wasn't afraid to say, you know, I don't have any experience in this. There's 120 people in the state legislature. They got to get 41 votes and 21 votes. And you better know what you're voting for. And I think what I got better at was trying to seek other issues and solutions and things that I had no background in, you know, uh, energy efficiency, um, developing uh, housing for workforce housing for young professionals, investing in education, growing our campuses. These were areas that I had no background in, no knowledge in, but was exposed to and had an opportunity to be a part of the debate. And whatever you choose to do and get involved in, bring a level of curiosity. And there are gonna be things that you're passionate about that drives you to be involved in public service but don't close the door to be passionate about things that you never thought of because those people are gonna need you too and they're gonna need a champion. And if you can tackle these issues, people are gonna to come to you because they want champions that are willing to take on tough issues. So that, that would be my advice. On that note, let's thank Majority Leader Lou Greenwald for a fascinating, inspiring, and enlightening discussion. I wanna thank all of you for coming out tonight. We will be having several more events uh, you will start getting our emails and you'll start hearing about them. We look forward to having you again. Thank you for coming to Rowan. Everyone drive safely getting home. Thank you.